Thirds. There are two things that we uh, kind of uh, can categorize or that comes into our mind and both are complementary to each other. What is that? That is called as quantitative research where you talk about data, you talk about numbers, you talk about measurements. Okay, then you have controls and the intervention group. Then you have controlled environments to do. And then, of course, there is reliability, there is randomized clinical trials, interventions, and finally, outcomes. This is, this is all to do with quantitative research and how you quantify your research. And there is yet another kind where you can take up research, which will add a little more value to your quantitative research. The next slide, please. Tanisha, next slide. Yeah. So this is the next, which is referred to as, no, 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 no. Back, please. Yeah. The qualitative research. What does it do? It talks more about quality. It is testing the effectiveness of a certain intervention. So it is talking about the quality of your intervention. You're talking about the numbers, choosing a sample size for the intervention is the quantitative type and the quality of your quantity, both. When you do the same intervention, say supposing you're trying to see the impact of or the effect of a Mediterranean diet in cardiovascular diseases, okay? Uh, so when you take a small sample of 50 patients and you do this Mediterranean diet, may not be so effective. The outcome may not be so effective or you cannot say that this can be applied to everybody. But if you say the same uh, components, same uh, topic, you apply it to a thousand people, then, then, then the impact, it's more qualitative or you can rely on the results. So that is what is the uh, impact of quantitative and qualitative. And then mining statistical associations. That's important. Evaluating outcomes, yes. When it is a small sample with the qualitative analysis, then the outcomes are different. When it is a large sample, then with the same, uh, you know, evaluating outcomes, then you can predict or you can say the, the, this is good outcome. And mining the statistical associations means, see, you can show it as being statistically significant in both the studies, whether it is a small sample or a large sample. But the impact of this is more applicable, more the merrier. When you have a large sample size and it is qualitatively correct, and then you have these statistical associations, then yes. And what is the qualitative uh, statistical analysis that you have to do to show your correlations and say, your research actually is working. That's important. And then elucidating the effects of the risk factors. That is most important. You may be doing an intervention. You may be doing a qualitative work. But then are you also looking at the risk factors that are coming with that intervention? So you have to look into that and then say qualitative research. And of course, in the social sciences or in community nutrition, not only the quantity, the qualitative research is also good where you have focus group discussions or you have, you know, detailed um, um, reviews with families or you have qualitative research like food consumption itself is a qualitative research where you calculate the household consumption units. So that's all qualitative research where you are trying to find the quality or the diet diversity scores. They, they, this is all to do with different kinds of... And then there are no risk factors in that that you have to see, but risk factors are always there when you look into some kind of intervention studies, especially that involves a human study. The next are you. I am moving my slide. Okay. The... Uh, Academy of Nutrition and uh, Dietetics uh, said that research for nutritional principle uh, professionals can fall into these four categories where it is an uh, interlink between practice, education, and the policy. You develop 
you are, the educational institutions can develop some kind of clinical nutrition research and all three of them are interlinked so it starts from the educate or the academy and then the academy tries to link with the practice okay those who are practicing and then there you do nutrition related discoveries this clinical nutrition you apply it to humans where you apply it in practice or in the public health areas and then bring about a policy that is what in general referred to as evidence based practice where you are generating a policy or you are generating a guideline or you are generating a evidence for it and so that is what is evidence based practice that uh, we have to do an extension of this the next slide an extension of more from the academy of nutrition and dietetics is the uh, uh, american dietetics association ada not the diabetes association but this is the dietetics association which has more so elaborated this and said that dietetics is an integration and an application of all principles of food science it can be biochemistry it can be just clinical nutrition it can be physiology it can be food management it could be behavioral science it could be social science all these are a part of nutrition nutrition is not just about eating but then it's the whole gamut which has an impact on this individual whom you are going to research on the individual can be in the community the individual can be in the hospital but it is all this you have to like for example you are just taking a patient of cirrhosis it's not about this what are his behavioral things or his lifestyle which has actually led him to this or is it uh, an autoimmune thing is it a genetic thing all this is something is it something which has got to do with some other condition which has led him to cirrhosis is it alcohol related non alcohol related all this is what it's not just about diet it's about the whole thing that comes into and is it what happens to the liver biochemistry also comes into picture what happens to the liver during the case of cirrhosis which has been researched which has been told to us and how do we look at some intervention for these patients is something that you have to see but again the same thing if you see all three of them it's the practice it, it is the academia it is the policy which is formed are all interlinked with each other it can have dietetics research which talks about delivery and dissemination of dietetic services it's about food consumption okay and then nutrition care process nutrition care process is something which starts from screening to assessment to diagnosis to implementation to monitoring to again evaluate monitoring and evaluation so all this is there in the nutrition care what is the outcome so how many of your patients have gone out of the hospital how many of them are doing functionally well how many of them have lost muscle at discharge how many have what is the 30 day mortality what is the 60 day mortality from discharge so all this is outcome that you can see what about just taking about the functional ability of a patient at discharge you just take a hand grip measurement and say what was it in the beginning what is it at discharge and probably if your patient is coming back for a follow up after one month what is it after one month it's it's a very simple thing but then gives you a lot of insight on the functional ability of a person this is the outcome that you can look at okay and then nutrition interventions itself nutrition intervention is i am trying to give a low salt diet to a patient what has happened to that what has happened to an as an outcome that i can see so these are all nutrition interventions that i want to see nutrition research is also there this is called as a basic science research where you do about uh, you know uh, molecules What, what what happens to this say for example i am just taking the lipid what happens to ldl when i give this is a basic science i can do a rat study i can do a human study but i have to know so i am just giving curcumin so then what what is happening to curcumin in the body has is it helping i give it to healthy individuals i give it to people who have 
uh, cancer and then different types of cancer and then see the effect. So that's a basic science. And then you're trying to find health biomarkers for, uh, you know, trying to say that, say, say, supposing some inflammatory marker, say IL-6, IL-10, the interleukins or, uh, you know, tumor nexosis factor. What is happening to them when I'm giving an omega-3? Is the inflammation reducing? Is the inflammation going up? So these are all biomarkers that I will see. And what are the nutrition functions that they perform in the body? For example, I'm taking fiber. What is happening to the gut when I'm giving soluble fiber? What is happening to the gut when I'm giving insoluble fiber? So these are all basic research where I have to do. Say you're doing the microbiome side studies. They're all basic science. They are not about uh, dietetic research. They are nutrition science. What is happening to the microbiome of the gut uh, microbiome when I'm giving this molecule for this period? So that is what happens. Then behavioral and social science. Yes, we know it's about psychological, social perspective, public health perspective, community nutrition perspective. We, we, we do a lot of community nutrition, uh, you know, audits, all of us, uh, especially uh, this is my experience when I was studying my MSc. Okay, way long. Okay, it's almost 30 years back that I did my MSc in Avinash Lingam University of Home Science. Yeah, so we, we have this um, uh, community nutrition where we are made to go to a village and uh, do a survey, village survey community nutrition survey. So we stay there for one month, we cook our own food. Then we, at that point of time, of course, it was not digitized. So we had large sheets, which yeah. you have to take and start writing everything, which is a part of the community nutrition survey that you have to do. And towards the end, after collecting the whole data, and of course the analysis was going to be done once we go back, but we had to do nutrition education. We had to go house to house visit and do about the various, uh, you know, nutrition education on the balanced diet, how to take and not to take. So what happened is, uh, uh, while I was doing this, there was one very smart old lady who said, uh, okay, good, uh, you're, you come and you've spent one month with us and nice that you're trying to tell us what is the lacuna that we have and all that. Good, you're also educating what to eat, what not to eat. But where is the money, she asked me then I had no answer. So, so I had to actually take in consideration that uh, the financial status is also an important contribution, important component contributing to nutrition. We have policies which talk about food security, but we don't have policies which talk about nutrition security. So it's research which has to talk. So you, it, it, it is the whole gamut which we have to look at when we are doing research. Then management research is about human research. That's about more about hospital management, could be community nutrition management and all that. I won't go detail. Then basic sciences is about biochemistry, okay, cellular and molecular biology, physiology, genomics. Genomics is coming in a big way. It's coming in a big way and uh, they're promoting it as having personalized nutrition. We'll know your genes and give you what diet your genes require. So that, that's still a very um, early phase, but uh, it can go large. And then comes the food science. Of course, we did a part of it when we were doing our MSc in food science and nutrition where you can do that, where you know about what happens when you're doing something. Food science, you have to know because this is very important when you do your, um, you know, some intervention study. That, that will come in my following slides where I will explain on that because food uh, research is very, very difficult. And I'll explain on this component when I come there. The next slide, please. So, so there is a relationship between varying types of dietetic research. It can be any one of these. And the arrows keep coming down and keep going up because the starting point is somewhere and the end point is somewhere. So it's like translation research generally starts off with the academia where they identify a question investigate the mechanism in a lab, okay? Then probably do animal trials and then take it up as clinical trials. 
then apply to a large medical center. So, you, you know, sometimes when you have nutrition department, then you do that and then you apply to your uh, attached hospital. Say, supposing you take, uh, what can I take? A PSG, PSG College in Coimbatore or you take uh, Manipal uh, College and Hospital or you take the Ramchandra College and Hospital where you can do the clinical trials, animal studies in the basic labs. And then convert the same thing and do it with your patients attached. So that becomes more easy. And of course, we do have a basic science lab in our own hospital. We do the basic science research, although we are a normal corporate hospital. We do a lot of basic science research. And then we apply it to a large population in our own hospital. So that is something very useful and apply it to small facilities and then see whether your research question is working in human population or not. Or you can take up epidemiological studies, which are large studies and then needs a lot of funding. You Everything is the same. You have to identify your question. What is the question that you want to answer? And then you see, where does it apply? What is the outcome that you are looking at? Is it going to be useful or not? And then you start applying and analyze the relationship, test the factor as an intervention, and then apply it in practice. So that is what. So large epidemiological studies have been done, and they look at it. Like, for example, um, um, uh, what can you say? Like diabetes, prevalence of type 2 diabetes, and you do large epidemiological studies to see impact of diet on the prevalence of type 2 diabetes. And what is the difference of diet in type 1 and type 2? So you can do this in large thing. And then practice-based. This is more to do with the hospital-based where you identify a pattern. Say, for example, uh, you know, we keep having these patterns in diet, like, for example, the keto diets. That's a pattern where, you know, you have large people trying to practice. So that is, you identify that pattern. Or off late now, what is in vogue is uh, your intermittent fasting. Okay, that's a pattern where you have large population trying to do the same thing. So you want to do that. And you ask a question on that pattern. Is intermittent fasting going to help in weight loss? Or is it going to help in reducing blood sugar levels? It could be either one of the questions. It could be both the questions. And then you work with research experts to design a study for this because your question is that. And then conduct the study in multiple practices. So you go to different age groups, different communities, okay, different areas. And then you keep trying to assess whether this pattern is the same. What is the pattern? And then analyze the data with research experts and then see whether it is actually good enough for applying it in practice. So when does it get into applying to practice? It should enter a guideline. It's not as simple as saying that, okay, I found out that intermittent fasting is good and there is good amount of weight loss and of course, uh, good change in the blood sugar levels, glycemia. And so let's uh, apply it in practice and promote it. No. It has to enter into the guideline. Entering into the guideline is not so easy. One study does not allow you to enter into a guideline or a practice point or a consensus report also for that matter. So you have to uh, do a large number of studies to support your question or a pattern so that it enters into a guideline. Like, for example, uh, they said consumption of sugar. That's a pattern. How much of sugar? Consumption of salt. How much of salt? And then what is the impact? So you have large number of studies and so the, it is there in the guideline how much of salt you should have as a practice. So that the, the, this is what is thing. And then you have these quality improvement programs, which is like, you know, you uh, before and after study. It's like a before and after study. You identify the problem, you collect the data, you find what is the cause of that problem, trying to find out different causes for that. Then you engage everybody and you identify a solution. That's important. You identify all the causes, then you identify a solution for it. And then test that solution, whether it is working or not. 
then collect the data again and see whether the solution has worked test more solutions if necessary and then implement that solution this is like a quality improvement program it's it's in local uh, language it's called before and after study before you collect then you after that you you make a practice change and then after that you see it's like that then evidence analysis you again identify a question then you do literature search it's like a meta analysis okay meta analysis is nothing but an evidence analysis where uh, you you can do a small uh, uh, analysis or you can do a large analysis it depends on uh, what is your capability of doing so you do the literature search then combine and weigh the data and say what is the prone so you, you sometimes you see that uh, consumption of fiber effect of fiber on the gut or uh, for constipation favors not favors you will see that and then you see the forest plot being given so that is what is an evidence analysis you take the evidences and say does this support my question does this not support my question so that is what is evidence analysis combine determine the answers and see what are the gaps create a practice guideline or a guideline implementation depending on what are the problems and don't so that is what is an rct also okay um, uh, randomized controlled trials where you try to do the trial to generate an evidence and then you start uh, making a guideline or uh, implement a guideline the next slide please so what is evidence based nutrition the practice of evidence based nutrition requires an integration of individual clinical practice with the best available external clinical evidence from systematic research that's what is important although um, uh, i will go back on that slide i'll just take one more minute please although you have an evidence to say that uh you know you can start feeding your patient immediately after surgery we have a guideline right the guideline says start right off once you know that the patient is out of the anesthesia 3 hours 6 hours and you start feeding your patient maybe an ng maybe an enteral feeding maybe an oral feeding but especially patients for gastrointestinal surgeries okay the guideline says you start off directly but does it really start so they use their clinical judgment to actually their, their clinical experience to follow the guideline but not now but later so so it's not always bad you have to use your clinical expertise before you actually uh, kind of use the guideline which is there sometimes you can tweak the guideline and start doing it but tweaking is all individualized which will fit your own requirements of your institution the next slide please there is something which is called as cognitive dissonance okay cognitive dissonance applies to research also where of course it applies to teaching also i i i kind of uh, used this slide for another presentation uh, where they said um, teaching methodologies to improve student outcome okay so in that that is what my first slide was this where there is cognitive dissonance uh, where uh, i said what is taught in the academia does not really happen in the hospital so it's like the teaching people are actually teaching apples and what actually is happening in the clinical practice is oranges so that is what is the dissonance same thing happens with research your the research which you are taking it as a research literature for your own question what you are going to answer could be talking about apples but you are actually talking about oranges in your research so that is what so that is very very important to identify what you want from the research sometimes you you should be very clever enough to identify what that paper is trying to convey 
so that you do not take a wrong information from that research article that is there so you that is what you should not be having cognitive dissonance the next slide please and this is what is important to prevent that okay you have to evaluate your literature or your publication in all these aspects you must know what is the source of that nutrition research is it a is it a source of a peer reviewed journal is it a single study is it a systematic review is it a meta analysis if it is a single study it has no value as compared to a meta analysis which combines thousands of studies yeah so that is what is important is it a peer reviewed journal or is it something that you've paid money and uh, not really reviewed but you paid the money and so they published your paper so that is what does that have an impact factor and what is the impact factor having an impact factor is also not important but what is the degree of the impact factor which will say what is the quality of the papers that they accept so that is what and what is the population that the study has studied which population has it been proven to is it an animal study so does that really apply to the human study is it a human body human model of the study but does it apply to your set of human population which you are trying to take so you should know that and what is the study type is it an observational study is it a cohort study is it a case control study or is it an experimental trial so all these will have an impact on the outcome and what are the methods that are used to collect the data like for example if you are talking about screening and assessment of the nutritional status of a patient are you actually using a validated tool or are you actually using created a tool which you just wanted some information that makes a difference the data collected using a validated tool for example if you use a food frequency and you want to publish your paper and saying that i found out all this using the food frequency food frequency table then the publisher will get back to you and ask was your food frequency table validated so that's what is important so is your tool validated to actually trust that paper for you to follow it in your own research and what are the results is it statistically significant that's most important or is it just a trend that they are showing having a trend is different from statistical significance and what is the significance that they have quoted or for proving their point and after all this is it clinically relevant to you that's most important that outcome what they have told in your paper is it clinically relevant to your research question you just cannot take any paper and start working on it and say yes they support it because their environment of proving is different from your environment of your question so clinically is it a valid thing for your environment to take that research paper is something so that you are in sync with trying to answer correctly your question once you are sure of all these points then your literature searching becomes more easy and what happens is your research you have to think about all this before you actually conduct a research then data collection is really easy and your results come out easily then you can actually write a paper very easily the next slide please so this is what once your research is done you produce the evidence and then you publish it that is what is evidence being available and then use the evidence to get research into practice for it it could be that you are using this practice for individual patients or could be using it for a large population depends on where you want to apply that like for example producing evidence 
long time ago long time i had just finished my msc a little after that when i was beginning to work with nian they had done research on what is called as ultra rice okay they named it as ultra rice ultra rice was nothing but what they did is they mixed uh, a chemical component of iron okay composition of iron in cooked rice okay they they cooked the rice they mashed it they mixed this iron uh, whatever composition that they want in the quantity which they actually did analysis okay and then they passed that paste of rice through an extruder and made it like a rice grain okay and then dried it and it looked like rice and they named that as ultra rice that is it is iron fortified rice basically to explain and what did they do with this they uh, and then they developed uh, a ratio to which you mix this ultra rice with the regular rice to see change in uh, iron status of the population because anemia is a large uh, problem in our community and so we would want to know whether because and rice is our staple and so you correct anemia with the staple food that we are eating so they did that in the community work and and i proved that iron status improved with regular consumption of ultra rice and given its limitations of various other attributes to why iron deficiency anemia happens and how you can apply it once they did this they have to give it give it back to the ministry and say we did this research and this is the evidence now you can put it into practice that is they have to introduce it to the populations introducing it to the populations is they have to identify how to mix ultra rice with the regular rice so that it is not misused so that is what so doing research is one end translating it it into practice is another end it has its own limitations risks and benefits when you convert research to evidence it it took it 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 has taken many many years for it to be implemented although research was done very long time ago so that is what is the all about research and converting it into practice for maybe for individuals or populations the next slide please and what are these steps in conducting research you define the question we we all talked propose the hypothesis or the purpose of conducting this question then plan the research design critically appraise the literature that is there conduct the research collect and analyze the data interpret the results apply the results in clinical practice evaluate your performance okay so let's take defining the question i just want to know the nutritional status of the patients or i want to know what is the uh, consumption pattern of patients in a hospital so or i can say nutritional status and consumption patterns of the patients so then i will say why do i want propose the hypothesis how do i want to do the uh, evaluation of nutritional status of patients do that i do it by one validated tool or i can say i don't want to just stick to one tool i want to do two methods and see what is the outcome that i would get in predicting the prevalence of the nutritional status with one tool with the other tool and then i will say once i know the nutritional status i also because there is one consumption pattern that i want to know say supposing i have said i will take patients who ever get admitted to this hospital for one month i will do the assessment of the nutritional status so say supposing there are 1000 patients every month who are admitted then i will assess the nutritional status of all the 1000 patients and then i will say i will take 25% of these patients and evaluate their intake okay so what i will do i will follow them up what they are eating what has been given to them 
what they have been eating for during their hospital stay. So then I will know what is their adequacy of eating. So their consumption pattern. Okay. Once they know that, and I uh, collect the data, collect the literature, I, I put on my points on what all things to collect and then how to connect, how do I develop the correlations, the eating pattern, and then how much is the deficit, what is the adequacy, everything I do. Then apply the results to clinical practice is most important because I've got the results saying that 50% of my patients were only eating 50% of the food that is given to them. Then 25% of my patients were eating only 40% of the food that is given to them. So then how do I apply that to clinical practice? I need to have a solution. So what is the solution? Because I have generated uh, information on the eating uh, adequacy of the patients. And I want to make this 50% consumption to 80% or 90%. How do I do that? I have one data. I want to improve the consumption of my patients. So then I will introduce an oral nutrition supplement because their consumption is only 50%. And that will add to another 30%, make it to 80%. That is what is converting into clinical practice. Then you evaluate again and see whether the consumption has improved or not. The next slide, please. What is right when framing a research question? There is no singular light. See, the same research can be done and the same research can be questioned in different ways. So there is nothing like it has to be this way. But the right question should have the following attributes. You can either build on what is already there or you question what has been proved. Say, for example, there is research already which says that there is prevalence of type 2 diabetes in young children. So you already know. So you can build on that also. What you can do? All the young children who come to your endocrinologist or a general physician, you get their blood parameters checked, your associated yeah. factors checked to see if there is a prevalence of type 2 diabetes among these younger children. When I say younger children, less than 18 years of age. Okay? Childhood type 2 diabetes. Okay? Or, and they say in a country like India, the prevalence of type 2 diabetes among children is about 3 to 5 percent. So you already know it. You build in your own community and say, does that same 3 to 5 percent exist in my uh, population or not? You test it. That is one way. Another way is you challenge it and say, it does not exist in my community. And you prove it. Either way. And the next question is, be as precise as possible. You cannot do everything under the sky with one research question. What is it? You have to be sure of what are all the data points that you want to collect. And what is the value addition of these data points to your research question? Irrelevant data points need not be collected because that is not answering your research question. Okay? And then be likely to yield unambiguous and interpretable results your research question should able to yield, give you very good results which can be interpreted or which is not confusing, which can be applied or which is understandable. Then that is the right kind of research that you can do. The next step, the next slide. Next slide. Yeah. And once your research data has been collected, then you have to do data analysis. You prepare the raw data for analysis. Okay, you need to enter and see how much is there. And then say, supposing inadequate data, those people have to be removed from the data 
what you've entered. And then cleaning the data is that. Okay. And then coding the data. That's very important. When you go in for a statistical analysis, you need to code all your qualitative data, quantitative data, and you have to go accordingly. Like, for example, you want to, you've collected data in such a way that patient, patient plate consumption, for example, how much the patient has eaten. So you've collected data with the plate model. So if he's eaten everything, the whole plate you've ticked. If he's eaten three-fourths, then you've ticked the three-fourth plate. If he's eaten 50%, you've ticked the 50%. But each one of them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and not eaten at all. Each one of them has one code. And so say, supposing you have patient A has eaten everything, then you give code one right there, code two. So that is what is coding. Then choose the most appropriate data analysis techniques. That is most important to prove your point. Your statistical analysis should be correct. What to use, when to use, which to use, you should know. You should have good knowledge and, of course, discuss yeah. with your statistician. You're, we cannot be jack of all arts. You should have the knowledge, but take the support of the statistician. Because it should not be that the statistician does what he or she knows. No, they should do what you want. And so you should also know what you want. So that is what is important. And then analyze the data, interpret the results, develop correlations, develop associations, develop the impacts, outcome. Say for example, I did one study. I was telling this for uh, a different population when I was doing my presentation. It took me almost three months. You know, I was reading a research article. I published quite a lot in uh, uh, clinical nutrition. But always my publisher asked me, what is the outcome that you're looking at? And most of my papers did not show any outcome. It was just an observational studies that I had presented, but never showed what is the outcome. Okay. I said the patient ate so much, but I didn't show what is the outcome of eating so much or not eating at all. So that is what always I had. And so I had to look at the outcome and most papers said uh, mortality as one of the outcome for nutritional interventions. I really didn't know how to see mortality as an outcome. I had to almost read for three months to understand how they actually collected data to show the mortality outcome. And then came, how do you actually analyze and connect the mortality outcome with your data? So what is the statistical tool that they would use? So I had to again read for another one month to know which is the statistical tool are they actually using to connect the mortality outcome with their data that they have collected. And then I went back to my statistician and said, sir, there is something like, which is called as Kaplan-Meier curve, where they are talking about mortality curve. So what is this? Then he gave me some information. He told me, you do this reading. And then I discussed, I almost discussed a month with him to know how to get the Kaplan-Meier curve, how to link the mortality with my data points. And then I did. So that is how you have to know to interpret your results. So that is important. And then, of course, draw conclusions in that. You cannot always draw because yours is a single center. You cannot draw conclusions to apply it to a larger population. Then you have certain limitations to tell in your paper. You should say, these were my limitations of the study. Because the first limitation is yours is a single center. So what should you be doing? You should do multi-center studies. To say that you have applied the same research component to different centers of different kinds of population. And so it is more applicable. Larger the merrier sometimes. So your conclusions are more assertive when your population is large. 
So you can draw conclusions. You cannot draw conclusions with a sample size of 50 and say, these are the conclusions and you can change it into practice. You cannot do that. So that is what is important for us to learn from research. The next slide, please. And where do you find this literature? You can find it from articles and reviews. You can find it from meta-analysis. Of this, if you see meta-analysis, Cochrane meta-analysis are very, very well known where they do large meta-analysis to find out if uh, they do some, uh, it, it has an impact or not, or the outcome is justified or not. Then, uh, like for example, okay, I'll tell that in the next slide. Then you have these practice guidelines who also give you, uh, you know, research uh, uh, that has been done on their guidelines. That's the main reason that as a country, India doesn't have guidelines in any of the areas because we do not have research supporting that in our... You have to do research in your population to have your guidelines. Why do we follow Aspen and Nispen and Canadian ADA, IDF, Kidoki, NFK? Because we do not have our own research to have our own guidelines. We can only have consensus reports, but they are not practice. Or we can have practice guidelines, but we cannot have recommended guidelines. Then you have systematic reviews where you can search and see what applies to the research question and then use them. The next slide, please. There is something called as the principle of finer. It's called finer. Feasible, interesting, novel, ethical, relevant for your research. Your research should be feasible. That means you should take adequate number of participants, adequate skill mix. That means your uh, research staff should have skill mix. It's not just about research population. It's also those who do research also should have a skill mix. Then is the project manageable with the existing time frame and budget? Everything is dictated by budget. Why is Radha strong? Because I talk about money. Though nutrition is a soft skill in a hospital, you don't know how to link to money. You have to learn to link to money. Then you become stronger. Why, why do certain academic areas become very strong? because they link it to money. So money is the whole thing. So why is your research very strong and good? Because you have a good budget for it. So how much can you do with the existing budget? So that is what is feasible. Okay. So what is it that, and then you have degree of feasibility. If your budget is low, you cannot do everything under the sky that you are uh, enthusiastic about doing. You can do something. So that is what. And it should be interesting. Will the answer be of interest to someone? So finally, when we do research, what is most important is, will the publisher be interested in it? That's more important. So you should know what is in trend and then start doing it. You cannot be doing research where you have already a thousand publications on that topic. So then why will the publisher publish your research when already there are 1000 publications? So what is the newness in it? Isn't it? So that is what is important. And it should be novel. That is what the publisher would look at. Is there any, is there no previous answer to this question? Or will the answer confirm, refute or extend the previous findings? That is what is important for us. So you, you, you have to find some, something which is different from what has been done. This happens only, doesn't happen out of the blue. You have to start continuously reading, updating, upgrading, and be in touch with what is running. What is there now existing? What is the research level that is happening? And then go ahead trying to use and see whether you want to do the same thing in your own population. Then we'll some, And what is most important in these research angles is you, it has to be more ethical. 
especially when it comes to certain interventional studies. Will somebody get hurt during this study? That's important. Okay, so say supposing you're testing a molecule. You know, you have these uh, clinical trials, especially the medical clinical trials. So you, you must know whether uh, there have been any adverse events or will it hurt? Will it be will it be a benefit or a risk? So you have to weigh that. And that is what is taking an ethical approval. So that is what is the ethics committee going to ask you? Is it going to be of any harm? Then if it is going to harm, then what is the solution to it? How is it that you're going to correct it? How is it that you're going to, uh, you know, address that issue? That's important. And it should be relevant. Who will benefit from the answer that you're getting? Is it the patient? Is it the hospital? Is it you? Is it the community at large? people at large, or is it going to help in developing a policy? Okay, so when, when you talk about this policy, uh, long time ago, uh, even now there is, but I had taken up, I had applied for research under the women's category with Ministry of uh, Biotech, uh, Health and uh, Family Welfare. And uh, under that, Ministry of Biotechnology, uh, gives you funding for women who are into research. Okay? So, and you should work. So, I applied for that and then I said, okay, uh, what I want to do is uh, food supplementation for women with HIV, AIDS. Okay? And the impact. With micronutrient, without micronutrient. Because these are considered as at-risk group. They were already getting food supplementation or they were getting a food ration, but micronutrient supplementation was not done. So, and I needed to develop a policy on micronutrient supplementation for women with HIV AIDS. So, we took up this large study and uh, I got the funding and then we were supposed to do, I did it with uh, Dr. Uh, Hari Kumar uh, from NIN, who was there in the public health division. And uh, we went to um, uh, Gandhi Hospital, uh, which is one of large uh, hospital here, a general hospital here in Hyderabad, and worked with the uh, HIV center. They have a, um, a, a, a center where these people, these uh, uh, candidates or patients come for the ART treatment and evaluation and a health checkup every month. So we went there and then recruited our uh, patients. And so we had to give them food. So we had to give them ration of rice, everything that is a part of the balanced diet. So all this is a part of the budget. And then we had to also give them micronutrients. So when we were calculating the food consumption of one then we said, okay, rice is okay. We will give them a little extra. But coming to something like pulses, we had to give pulses for uh, protein. Then we said, we cannot give only for her. We have to give for the family. Because if we do not give for the family, then she's going to give her portion to the family to eat. So what, how is her nutritional status going to improve? And what is it that I am going to prove? Isn't it? And then as part of the protein requirement, we also had eggs to be distributed to them. Same question. I can't give her two eggs per day and say 